Just a quick word of warning before we get going that the following podcast will almost certainly contain spoilers and may also contain strong language and conversations of an adult nature. Welcome to episode 13 of Strong Language and Violent Scenes, the podcast giving a second chance to films that might not deserve them. As ever, I'm Mitch Bain, I'm a horror writer and an occasional doer of musical things. And I'm Andy Stewart, I am an occasional maker of disgusting things. Films, specifically. Films, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And I'm very happy to be joined tonight on the Skype phones once again. Um, You know her best as the writer-director of Imitation Girl, uh, Natasha Kermani. Good evening, thanks for joining us. Hi, how are you guys? Thank you for having me. We're very well. Thanks well, thank for Thank you for in. doing this. Yeah, yeah. And we are very well. Thank you. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah. um, right, I want to jump right in. So, Natasha, you've gone for 1995's Johnny Mnemonic. I uh, did. Yes, which uh, it's an interesting choice and I think a really good selection <sighs> for the format. Um, <laughs> so, before we get into the kind of, kind of get to the real bones of this, tell us a little bit about your background with this film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I know it's a bold choice, but I'm here to defend it. Yes. Um, I uh, I grew up, I was a huge William Gibson fan. So um, I started with, I actually started with his novel Idoru and then worked my way backwards to Neuromancer and all of his classics. Um, and I was basically just consuming everything I could uh, of his. Um, Which, by the way, includes a really pretty awesome X-Files episode for any X-Files nerds out there. It's called Kill Switch, and it's awesome, and William Gibson wrote it. And so, yeah, I think I was at a video store, and I think Keanu probably caught my eye first. And then I looked deeper within and found that it was, in fact, based on the uh, William Gibson short story. And, um, yeah, the rest is history. I mean, I just loved it. I ate it up. Um, I was pretty young, I think, when I first saw it and impressionable. So um, I think maybe the... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the less savory things about it didn't really bother me. Um, but yeah, I've seen it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Yeah, that, that, was <laughs> something, that was something I was going to ask because a lot of the time when people come on here and they pick films, uh, a lot of the time it's something that they've got kind of like um, a really deep-seated <laughs> affection for from kind of childhood. So like, how old were you when you saw this for the first time? I mean, I think I was probably 15, right. 14 or 15. Yeah. Um, I, I, You know, again, it was a video store discovery and I, I worked at a video store, of course. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I had kind of gone through all the shelves and uh, yeah, I mean, it became a habit. I, For some weird reason, I had a weird thing where I would watch it before I would travel. It would make me feel very like calm and it, it was like sort of a meditative thing. But yeah, I've Jesus. seen it um, a lot. Yeah, it was a weird relationship that I had with this movie. I think I would just leave it on in the background and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, I mean, I can, I, it's very I, weird, I know. <laughs> I can understand the, the Keanu thing uh, certainly grabbing you because this is at peak Keanu. This is when Keanu, peak, yeah. Keanu was super hot back then. <laughs> And he's I don't, still super. I mean, he Keanu is still super hot. Don't get me immortal. wrong, but uh, back immortal. then he was uh, coming right off the back he's, of Speed. I think. Uh, yeah, Speed, which I love. Um, I think this is also where circa um, Dracula, the Bram yeah. Stoker's Dracula, uh, <laughs> which he's also is he's Keanu in. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> That would be a good one too, actually. But although I don't know if people think that's a good movie, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So that was my 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 inroad to it was William Gibson. I was just a huge fan of the books and the short stories, and um, I think knowing what Gibson's world is also maybe enhances your enjoyment of the film, or maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it enhanced, but it enhanced yours, you think? It did. I think it was fun for me to see these characters. I mean, the um, I'm sure we'll get into it, but the a lot of the characters that we see in this film are reappear in his world, and his themes are kind of coming back. So yeah, I mean, I think for me it was just my William Gibson fangirling, <laughs> uh, plus Keanu, of course, and Henry Rollins, and all the all the greatness. 
Right. Before we jump in, and I know that you've listened to an episode or two before, so I think you might yeah. know what's coming. But um, I think that this is probably one of the episodes where it's most imperative to have seen the film before you listen. But um, for the benefit of anyone that hasn't, <laughs> we have 30 seconds on the clock. Uh, can I just say oh quickly, uh, can it, I just say quickly, I'm extremely excited <laughs> about this plot being boiled down to 30 seconds. Yeah. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if it's possible, but I'll try. Yeah, on a three count, are you ready to give this a try? Let's try it. Yeah, okay. let's go. <laughs> right, three, two, one, go. All right, so the year is 2021. Uh, mega corporations kind of are in charge of everything, and there's a plague spreading uh, amongst everyone. So we have peak 90s Keanu, who kind of comes in, and he uh, is a courier, so he tra- he kind of puts information in his brain uh, that's super sensitive, and uh, these bad guys want the information, and so they want his head. So the movie is people chasing Keanu and trying to cut off his head. <laughs> And he uh, he escapes and he gets the information Time. out. Time. Ah. That, I would say, was not bad. Not bad at all, actually. Yeah, so you, you got a decent amount through it. Well, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a lot that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> that was missed. I think that like uh, I think that this might be the hard in, in fairness yeah. to you, Natasha, yeah. I think that this might be the hardest one to boil down to thirty seconds. I mean I think the, sc- the scrolling credits at the beginning of the movie it's probably like three minutes long. <laughs> well, I, and that's, that's just the fucking setup. So. That's like, actually that's actually what I thought you were leading with. Like when you started oh, doing have. it, I was like mega corporations. I was like, oh shit, she's doing the scroll. Um, I should have done that. I should have. Done, I mean, that would have taken. I would have needed three minutes. I couldn't have done that in thirty seconds. Uh, well, I think actually, yeah, like that's a nice lead into just actually just kind of getting right into this. And I think that of the many kind of firsts, I think with this <laughs> podcast, I think that this probably holds the record for the earliest I've been confused by a film. All right, because like, <laughs> cause like by, by the time I got to the end of the by the time I got to the end of the opening crawl, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so it's so hilarious. <laughs> I think I think it like it, it it like it raises a lot of questions that it answers later. Yeah, it's it also does, yeah. decidedly heavy-handed. Like the language yeah. of it is so so heavy-handed. It's very it's dramatic. So intimidating. Like you've got words like terminal, terminal capitalism, and like armored yeah, towers, man. and it's super fucking <laughs> it's heavy. The real, that's the real shit. That's the it's twenty twenty one. Like that's that's what's up. Mega corporations. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it almost feels like a William Gibson impersonator wrote it. So it was like he couldn't be bothered to actually write the copy, so they just... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, out- they outsourced. <laughs> well, famous... Yeah, they outsourced it, yeah. <laughs> Famously, he wrote a script for it, um, which was advertised to be the script yeah. that was filmed, and he kind of distanced himself from it. He was like, no, this was not me. Uh, don't tell me with this brush, please. Is he the sole credit? Yeah. Is, has he got the sole writing credit on this? I believe he does, oh, wow. um, or, or maybe there's a co, but he definitely, he is responsible for it. Um, he So this is kind of interesting. Um, apparently, he and Robert Longo, the director, uh, mm. who is an artist, and this is his only feature film, yeah. thank God. Um, <laughs> he and William Gibson wanted to do this as an art house film, so they wanted to shoot it for, you know, like a million five and just do a small... Uh, art art house film, which I think would be kind of brilliant. Um, mm. And then it's the age old thing, right? You can't raise a million dollars, so you do it for thirty. With Keanu Reeves. <laughs> I wish I had that problem. Oh, well, um, me yeah. too. Me too. Believe so I, me. I, I, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, sort of the origins, and then, however, it got distorted from there. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so, I kind of feel like um, the, the two main takeaways are the things that we should try and pull from the crawl. Uh huh are the notion that I think it's information is sensitive and very easily hackable now. Yeah. And as a result, that's kind of like, that it's now entrusted to kind of like what they call mnemonic, uh, mnemonic couriers, which are like kind of human USB sticks, basically, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that like, well, hackers rule, the like real life killer is the kind of disease that kind of exists in the abstract for quite a lot of the yeah. film, uh, nerve attenuation syndrome. The black shakes. The black shakes, <laughs> yeah. yes. The black shakes. <laughs> I was saying that's a great name for a band, but you wouldn't want to yeah. explain where it came from. Like it's a bit yeah. embarrassing. That would be, yeah, you're right. That would be a great band name. Yeah, um, which is not in the story. the The disease is not in the story, by the way. So that's something they added. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. You don't actually ever know what he's carrying in the short story. I feel yeah, like that serves it better. Different. Absolutely, absolutely. The story is also more about the bodyguard Molly Millions, who got turned mm-hmm. into something else. But, so there's a lot different from the. If anyone is listening and interested, uh, I definitely recommend reading the short story. 
So I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> no, the I short story first, and then the and then the movie. Yeah, I kind of want to now. I think you should. It could, yeah, because it kind of sounds like there's like a little bit more subtlety in there. One thing this film is not as subtle. In That's any, true, I guess. <laughs> in yeah. any way, shape, or form. So um, our first encounter with Keanu, Johnny, Johnny, and this is uh, you know, you see him waking up in the hotel. And genuinely when, like, because obviously, uh, like, say, full disclosure for everyone, I was watching this for the first time when I watched this two nights ago. If anyone's surprised by that revelation. Yeah, I've, 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 I've uh, never seen anything. So, yeah. No, um, <laughs> so, obviously, I my acquaintance with the idea of mnemonic careers was just from The Crawl. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, it was like, oh, it's like, they're, they're, it's entrusted to them. And, obviously, it was implied that he was one of them. And then when he starts talking, I was like, right, so is he a half-robot or what? And I thought, like... <laughs> Oh, oh no, no, he's not. No, and it's like, no, I understand now that he isn't. No, he's just a terrible actor. <laughs> but it's like, I remember just like uh, in the line deliveries and stuff, I was like, oh, is there like is there like a robot thing going on here? I understood. I kind of came around fairly quickly to the fact that it wasn't. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's just Keanu. Yeah. It's just Keanu being Keanu. It's understandable why you would think that. Although I would say that Schwarzenegger in the Terminator gives a more nuanced performance. Savage. Um, <laughs> then Keanu does here. Does here. He's wow. that's to me is a Keanu low point. Oh, um, I don't know. It's quite bad. It's You've, quite poor. Have you seen the Lake House? I have seen the Lake House. Yeah, <laughs> we've say. discussed the Lake yeah. House many times between us, and I feel I feel that this is this is <laughs> this is bad. I don't like, think this it's is worse. Bad. The the film also I understand where you're coming from because we also start in the internet, so I can understand. Oh, yeah. you kind of <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, you're you're actually in the cyberverse, so I understand you think maybe he's been, he's coming from the internet. So yeah, I I understand. I, understand. I, like, it does, uh, I actually it feel does. like that's something we shouldn't have glossed over. Yeah. This film actually starts physically inside in the, the internet. internet, and it pulls out of his yeah. eye. So it yeah, kind of it kind of pulls out onto his eye. So I guess it's understandable that you would believe him to be a robot. I, I quite like the yeah. fact that I floated this as an idea where I felt kind of stupid for thinking of that and you've both kind of made me feel slightly less dumb by giving the idea some credibility. <laughs> I, someone, someone. I understand where you're coming from completely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so he has like a, the first of the interactions that he has with uh, Ralphie. Udo. Uh, Udo Kier. Who... Udo Kier's the MVP in this film. Udo... He's the best thing in the film. Udo Kier's having an absolute <laughs> blast in this film. <laughs> He is. He's great. Uh, he's perfect for the world, too. This, like, cyberpunk, weird, uh, underground universe. He's just totally perfect. I believe him 100% in, in this universe. Yeah, I, I think he's the... He's th- handler. Yeah. Handler, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, uh, is, that, is, that word, like, that, is that the word that's used? I don't know, but I, yeah, but I would say Natasha's very much hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Yeah. In any other world, he would be his handler. Handler, yeah. No, Johnny... Agent. Yeah. I, I, I had agent written down, but I like handler. But I th- yeah, I think he's the strongest link in the chain here, performance-wise. I think he's the best. <laughs> wow. No, no love for Ice Tea, huh? No I've love. Got, no, I do have a lot of love for Ice Tea, but I was waiting to get on to Ice Tea because oh, he's yeah. fucking, he's fucking great. You've got a point. Is he, uh, Ice Tea. Yeah, he's not here yet. He's now, not here yet. Now Johnny wants out. Johnny's been doing this courier gig for a while now, and obviously part of being a courier is that you have to sacrifice a certain portion of the memory within your brain to accommodate the other information, and he cho- and Certainly, Johnny has lost his memories of childhood, so he kind of wants, <laughs> which apparently amount to eighty gigabytes. <laughs> yeah. now, now, here comes the, here comes the science part, right? I did some research on the internet oh, right. into the memory storage capabilities of the human brain, and the human brain yeah. can hold two point five petabytes of digital memory. Now that is two point five million gigabytes. <laughs> That's three million hours of streaming, or, or sorry, downloaded TV programs. <laughs> so I think he could. They're a little it. off in their numbers. Yeah, They're off in their. It could have fit it in there. I th- I think though that like I find it quite difficult to give. See, because it's very easy to forget that this film is now twenty three years old. Yeah, and it's and I think that like because of that, I think that for all of the various other things that I don't think are right about this film. I think that like I think it's it's unfair to kind of like I think if you're guessing what 2021 is like and you guess shallow to where we ended up I think like I think it's harsh to give it a hard time for underestimating technology advances because what? 80 gig obviously sounds ridiculous because it's basically it's like it's like he's the human equivalent of like a fairly half an re- iPhone 
And yeah. Half an, yeah, exactly, half an iPhone. And it's like, Just think, over a Blu-ray. But, like, but I think that like, I don't know if I could... Like, if you asked me to guess what where technology would be 20 years, in the, 20 years in the future now, I couldn't do it accurately. So I think that of all the various things you can, you can kind of rib the film for, I think that it's a little bit harsh to go too hard on that. Well, it's also worth noting that the memory of the spaceship that got the first man on the moon was 64 kilobytes. Right. So that's maybe insane. if you extrapolate it from that, it's a it's a figure <laughs> that seems astronomic, but in actual fact might be just all right. Yeah, it I might th- make sense. I, I think without context, it's difficult. I think that like it's difficult to make those kind of estimates. And that's the end of my research. It's all downhill <laughs> that from good. here. That's interesting. Well, they got a lot of other things right, though. I mean, I think like the the mega corporations is is pretty convincing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I believe that for sure. A lot of the cultural stuff is, mm-hmm. is, isn't is that unbelievable, right? So yep. You've got the, the influence of Big Farm. Right. Yeah. Very yeah. true. Very true. <laughs> yeah, a couple of things you could see being the trajectory for three years' time. Like, when you, like yeah. those kind of things. <laughs> three years away? Fuck. <laughs> yeah, but like, I mean, yeah, it's 2021. That's where we are. Um, this is like another element that, that we get into kind of fairly early on. Because, yeah, because, like you say, he's trying to retire. This it's, is his last big gig. Yeah, it's like it's it's like it's kind of like one more job. One more job. Yeah, it's like the heist thing, isn't it? It's like one big yeah. score, one last score, right. kind of thing. Exactly. Now, I need some help with this. So <laughs> he he does he take an implant that theoretically like can double his storage? He does. He takes it's a, a, a doubler. booster, a doubler. Sorry, yeah, a, yeah, a doubler. Yeah, look, at, <laughs> look how happy she looks. And. Um, <laughs> But yeah, but then when he goes to, and this is something that this is something I found really disorientating, and right, I got around about the first twenty minutes of this, where I felt like a lot of kind of factions and warring sides were mm-hmm. introduced with very little preamble, right? <laughs> and then I was, yeah. like, I was like, wait a minute, sorry, who is the this? Work. They're making the audience work, okay? You you, you got to keep up. Yep, you got to mm-hmm. treat you got tra- treat your audience. You got to treat your audience like adults. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but like, so, but yeah, when he goes there and he, he's got this 160 gig storage and they tell him that he's gonna, it's going to be 320 that they're giving him. Isn't right. It? It's like, which well, by the way, makes me think that, that Johnny is kind of like a ghetto courier because these guys are like not, they don't think it's that crazy that it's 320. They're like, Oh, but we paid for, you know, a top tier courier and Johnny's walking around with 80 gig availability. Like, get yeah, out that, of here, bro. Yeah. That's like... Yeah, that's fair, actually. <laughs> yeah, you know? I so, he, so, but he's up for it. I mean, he, he, yeah, he does it. Yeah, he goes he's, for it. He's but, straight in, despite despite the um the threat of uh, synaptic seepage. Seepage is such a horrible word, and it's <laughs> it's said all the time. Any time you think it's any kind of seepage, it's never good. Like it's such a gross word, and it kept I think it kept annoying me. I think <laughs> it's, I, I think it's a really good term for that though synaptic seepage for like for what is going to happen to him or like if he mm-hmm. stores this for too long i i like i liked it as a i liked it as a phrase okay um you're going to use the word seepage constantly now because it sets me on edge <laughs> yeah no, no, no like <laughs> yeah <laughs> Jesus. It's dangerous stuff, seepage. You don't want seepage in your brain, you know. Yeah, like, uh, like, like it's, never, it's it's in the bottom three places that I want seepage. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Correct. Correct. But Johnny is up for the challenge. That's how desperate he is to oh, get yeah, out yeah. of to get out of the game. So yeah, but, I mean, he's what he's looking for eight hundred thousand dollars, I think, to get his memories back. I remember that. Right. I remember that being a figure that's thrown around. That's- very specific. I'm yeah. impressed that you remember that. Thanks. It's a lot of money. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's serious cash. Um, um <laughs> so this the storage seems to be on like like some kind of mini disc. And again, I'm not going to rib the technology choices sure. of the film too much. I don't because like, I think that that's kind of trite. But like, um, the upload sequence is amazing. Like, see when when they're actually like putting the data into his brain. I love that because I kind of felt like that was in terms of effects and things. It kind of felt like it was the full reach mm-hmm. for the time. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Like, like yep. today, that would be their proof of concept, right? That scene of oh, him sure. walking yeah. into the hotel and he holds up the briefcase, like a pizza, makes a pizza joke or something. It's not funny at all. Double cheese oh, anchovy. But, yes, double cheese anchovy. By the way, disgusting. So, Keanu, <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like that would be their proof of concept, right? Because that's the whole thing. They're visually mm-hmm. showing this data going into his brain and they've got the little implant, which is a great little practical effect. Um, and then just those beautiful, beautiful 90s visual effects of the internet is just, yep. but it's also his brain. So it's, 
I don't really understand why it looks the same as the internet, but you know, whatever. It's all good. It's data. It's just so, data like, flow. I'm feeling incrementally less bad for thinking it was a robot at the start. Yeah. I think they just paid somebody to just do like, let, can we just get 15 minutes of mad cyber looking shit? And then we'll, yeah. just, we'll just cut it throughout the film. Like It doesn't yeah. need to make any sense. Just go for it. <laughs> it doesn't, though. And, it, then it works that way. Yeah, no, no. I was going to say, I, would, I also love the very, very random pop uh, references. So they're watching, like, a, I think it's like a Hitchcock movie or some, a Bogart movie or something old. And then for some reason, uh, there's, like, cartoons. There's, like, you know, because the password is being taken. So anyway, to take it a step back, it's encoded, right, with a password that is gathered from his surroundings. So yeah. like things that he sees or whatever. So that's kind of what's triggering these little visions for him and they get translated into a visual passcode. And I just think it's so whimsical. I just love it. I mean, you know, we moving forward, we have like the Matrix and all these kind of stunning science fiction films that came after this, but they're they're so bleak, right? Like we kind of lost like all of the the color and whimsy from these like pre-matrix science fiction movies so yeah it's goofy but i kind of love the the goofiness of it is part of the fun you know so that's my rant <laughs> yeah I, I think that's fair <laughs> what i love is in the immediate aftermath of his upload uh he kind of he kind of struggles to regain his composure and he has to kind of go to the toilet and splash water on his face and just do a little bit of tai chi to kind of to kind of oh, set, I love that scene. To kind of, oh. to kind of center us, to kind of center himself. It's so good, and I don't know about you, but every time I watch that, I always have to do it with him. I like, I'm just so, I'm in the zone with Keanu in that moment. His intensity, he's just there, man. He's totally there. Oh, I love that man. scene. Brilliant. Yeah. And that random cutaway when he's getting uploaded or downloaded or whatever. Uh, the cutaway to the guy who's like eating lo mein or something. I don't know if you guys remember this, but it's a very weird cutaway. Everyone's like, oh my God, are you okay? And then one dude's just been like shoveling noodles in his face <laughs> through this whole sequence. If those noodles in the room. <laughs> shout out just... to that guy. Yeah, yeah, shout out to that guy, wherever you yeah. are. I hope you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's okay. yeah, yeah. If those noodles in the room, that's my primary focus. <laughs> I, don't care what, I don't care what else is going on. Well, uh, whatever that guy is in the world, I hope things turn out. <laughs> yeah i hope everything is good yeah so yeah it's and, and then at that point the kind of hideout that he's a gets kind of stormed by gunmen yeah yakuza gunmen yeah yakuza gunmen thank you yeah. and um and uh I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna try and stop calling him keanu i'm gonna start calling him johnny yeah johnny um but like yeah. he um uh but he he dispatches a fair amount of them before yeah. he makes it does escape. yeah he does that's that's true and that's like that's a, i think it's like a reasonably well choreographed sequence as well i think like with the mm -hmm. the kind of Fighting and stuff like that. That is pretty good. Uh, yeah, it's a bit stilted and slow, but I think that's a lot of the films like that. Mm. Um, but, I, I mean, there are things... I don't like the film particularly, right? I'm just going to get that out there now. But <laughs> there are charming things about it that, that I quite like, that I quite enjoy, that keep me watching it, even though I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> there are things that keep me watching. And it's little daft things like just how stilted and kind of awkward it all feels mm -hmm. it, th that, i agree that to me is a charming thing that encourages me to g just give it another five minutes and then i get another of those weird charming things that i'm like and then oh. it's over yeah i'm like oh those, those henry rollins i'll watch for another five minutes uh and then something else my oh, there's a dolphin yeah, yeah, the dolphin is brilliant. I think um, it was meant to be funny. So uh, William Gibson has said that the sort of the original artsier version of it was meant to be more comedic. Okay. So, okay. I mean, I think if you look at it through that lens, it, you can also kind of let go of a lot of the <laughs> issues that you're faced with. <laughs> yeah, like so, like some of the more kind of ex, like some of the more kind of like some of the eccentricities of it. So Johnny escapes, right. and I don't know if this is true. It's certainly the way I perceive it. And coming off the back of the last two films we watched, The Ninth Configuration, which has a minstrel scene, and Confessions, oh no, oh, uh, Memoirs, Memoirs of an Invisible Man, man yeah. which has a kind of really dodgy blackface moment. Does Keanu go yellow face <laughs> when he puts on the wig and the berry? Because I'm pretty sure he does. And, and I'm not okay with it. Like it just seems to be a recurring theme all of a sudden in the films we're I, watching. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold my hands up and admit I did not clock this when I watched it. Seriously. <laughs> well it's a wide shot, so we'll have to go back and, and zoom in. 
it's to on, determine. Yeah, let's let, let it's on par <laughs> with when Sean Connery did it. Uh, when he yellow faced up to be a Japanese guy, and uh, mm. that James Bond film with the volcano and the like, the missile in a volcano. Yeah, he did do that. He, he did, did do, do that. Oh, he did do that, and it is bad. Yeah, yeah. troubling. Uh, uh, let, let's let's just like for now, let's just say that that needs a second look, and let's not speculate yeah. too much. <laughs> and if anyone wants to tweet us to confirm that, or deny, or, or say that I'm way off base, please do. But. Yep. Uh, looks, I would also like to know. It's quite clear to me that that's what happened. No, we'll report back if we get any feedback on that one for sure. Even if Keanu <laughs> wants to get in touch, um, <laughs> that'd be lovely. Yeah, he's he's a vocal supporter of the show after he, all. Yes, so. he, he loves it. Um, no, um, it's shortly after this. We cut to New York, and we kind of you understand the implicate <laughs> straight to New York. Can um, I just just before we go there, if you must, <laughs> we're introduced to Shinji in this scene. Okay, uh, in, the, in yes! this scene. Who, yeah, he is the, what would you call him, the underling of Takahashi, who's played by Takeshi Kitano. Who is Beat only, Takeshi. Beat Takeshi, who's only credited as Takeshi, which is fucking awesome. Like, he's the that's it. He's the coolest he guy cool. in the film, but he has this awesome ring that's like a laser garrote. Mm-hmm. And in this scene, we get, the, we get the first two of many, many scenes of hand trauma. Yes. There is, I'd say there's, 10 moments of extreme hand trauma in this film. And this is the first scene. The guy gets his hand chopped off, guy gets his fingers chopped off and they land on a salad. It's, ah, it's very visual. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I think it's a prosthetic thumb. It's meant to be a, a, a like an enhanced oh, right, okay. battle thumb. I thought it was like a, I thought it was like a, thumb. <laughs> Google gadget thumb. <laughs> It is. I think it is. Yeah, but, but I actually think those effects stand up pretty well. I have to say, they're right. they look pretty good. Yeah, I think I think a lot of that stuff does look really good. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah I think it has held up pretty well. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I like the I like the fact that we've got um, uh, so we I think that it's it's when we get to New York that we understand the implications of synaptic uh, seepage in its entirety, where it's like you know he'll actually like he'll die. Neural failure in twenty four hours. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, like they'll like if they don't kind of hoover the stuff out of his brain. Um, so <laughs> they might as well. It's as believable as what happens. You know what I mean? I mean it's like, um, but it's shortly after this, and I really, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this because okay. everything that happens when they go to the nightclub is fucking astonishing. Oh right, yeah, the night cl- the nightclub scene's incredible. It There's is so much stuff. It's like because it kind of feels like it's like it's simultaneously this underground like industrial club, but also someone singing opera. Yeah, <laughs> As I was like, it's like it's house opera. It's, yeah. it's uh, and and I may be wrong about this, but I always interpreted that as being um, uh, the magic flute, the queen of the night from the magic flute. Right. She kind of has like this lunar theme. <laughs> of art direction behind her but then there's like a house beat happening underneath it it's way way ahead of its time <laughs> <laughs> the score actually kind of starts kicking in with some real real force here and it's a real it's a real it's just heavy, great it's just chug a guitar and some noodling on guitars and then some kind of weird house stuff the whole way through and that more than anything, more than anything else that happens, sets my teeth on edge. <laughs> um, really, is that the thing yeah. that you yeah. find the most disorientating? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I try to struggle with the score quite a lot. Yeah, I get that. Um, I think that was also very controversial during the making of, because um, I think uh, uh, Longo had a very specific idea of what he wanted for the music, and I, I think they went through a lot of different um, bands and tracks and all that kind of crazy stuff. So who knows? But there we have it, a score for the ages. <laughs> yeah, definitely. The actual soundtrack's quite strong. Like, the, the kind of licensed stuff, it's pretty strong. Yeah. I just want to say that. Um, <laughs> so it's around this time we run into, uh, we meet Henry Rollins' character, Spider. Spider. Yeah. Um, Henry Rollins' performance in this is interesting. I think Henry Rollins, <laughs> Henry Rollins as a casting choice, I think, is interesting as well for this character. Agreed. I, I think he's great. He probably, I would imagine that they met like on the art scene, you know, like I like to think that he and Robert were at a club together and, and Robert saw him and he was like, oh shit, Henry Rollins, I love you, be in my movie. And that's how that happened. That's what I like to think happened. Yeah, um, or like they met at a Rollins band show or something yeah. like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, when I first watched this, I, I wasn't really aware of Henry Rollins as a musician yet. Right. So this uh-huh. was actually my introduction to him. 
um, as this like kind of hunky, nerdy scientist dude. Um, so yeah, this I think of him fondly from this from this film. He grounds it in a lot of ways, though. I think. Yeah, he kind of becomes kind of the backbone of the thing a little bit. <laughs> I and think... he has some of the worst lines, by the way. Yeah, he I've... gets. Yeah, I think yeah, his think performance it. is. I think his performance is quite poor. But like, uh, do you just th- saying it, just do, putting it out there. You, I love Henry Rollins, but his performance is quite poor. Do you think it's arguable though that with the lines that they're giving him to say, that he's doing the most with the least? Yeah, he's very much doing uh, his his one man show with a lot of the dialogue. He gets a lot of really intense kind of fast paced dialogue to kind of work through. So I don't know if he was. Well, doing... he's always concerned. Yeah, that's definitely true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's very worried. Well, he also, a lot of the exposition comes from him, which is tough, you know. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I give him a pass on that. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think, but I think that you're right. That like, I think that he is the one who, yeah, like, in terms of the lines he's given, it does the most of the expositional heavy lifting. He's kind of like the, he's kind of, he's kind of like the Cliff Notes character. Yeah. And he yells most of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Henry Rollins. <laughs> Well, he is he is responsible for Jane's uh, uh, her enhancements or her um, whatever cy- cyborg yeah. abilities. So he's like a hack a hack doctor. He's a but then also apparently super legit. I don't know. He's a he's flesh both. mechanic. Apparently. Flesh mechanic. Is that the job title? That's yeah, cool. that's uh, that's pretty gnarly. And like yeah, that. I mean, yeah, we can't fly past the nightclub scene without talking about this. Yeah, we also meet Jane Dina Meyer. Yeah. And our first Dina and our first feature. Oh really? Yeah, first feature. Uh, I love her look is like Joan of Arc. It's like cyberpunk Joan of Arc. She's got like a suit of armor on, which I always thought was cool. Yeah. I also thought it was way fucking cool that the bodyguards were like all uh, in the story. They're called Razor Girls, but they're all like these cybernetically enhanced, like badass chicks that get hired by the you know get hired to be bodyguards. So I thought that was super cool, um, way ahead of the time. And that scene is actually pretty loyal. Um, but yeah, I, I love the ambiguity of that scene they don't really go in and they don't even really explain what the fuck is going on you just <laughs> kind of have to keep up uh and the script is uh, you know 40 percent of the words that are said are not real words it's like gibsonian nonsense <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> science fiction words um which i just love i mean i loved that oh, i mean man. i probably had to watch it a bunch of times and i had my little dictionary of like oh this means this this means that i loved it and uh, no sooner do they leave that we also, but it's like the, we get quite a lot of the kind of like the quite a lot of big character introduction stuff goes on mm-hmm. in this section because we also run into J Bone for the first time. J Bone, alias Ice T. J Bone. I just I don't know how that happened. I'm so curious. Like I I don't know. Oh He's God. just so wonderful. Well, as in like, um, as in like, what convergence of events happened before we got Ice T in this role in this film? Yes. Okay. Yes. I want to know everything. I'm so curious. I mean, did he did he have a meeting? You know, did they have coffee? And he's like, "Hey, man, here's my vision for the character." You know, um, <laughs> I mean, obviously he was super hot at the time, so they, you know, they were probably excited to have him on board. But um, he's extraordinary. I see, is extraordinary. <laughs> this must have been around about the time he was in Tank Girl as well, where he played a kangaroo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> be, oh, career. oh my god it had to be round about the same time he, he, he's fucking killing it <laughs> but he's he amazing is it. He's, he's, he's absolutely amazing and he must have been at this time he was he would have been in body count and stuff like that he'd have been doing yeah body count play, he'd have been yeah. playing kind of heavy metal gigs with body count so, while <laughs> also having an extraordinary music career right he's yeah. doing all these things yeah, he, he is quoted somewhere saying, someone asked him about his acting technique and, and he says something like, well, I, I read the lines. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I was like, was that, like, that is 100% true. There I you presumably. go. And yeah. that's what happens in this movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he puts, he's there though. He's there for it. And I feel very calm in his presence. You're like, nothing that awful can happen when J-Bone is around. That's fair. Um, yes, he's. He is the leader. He runs Heaven. Heaven, uh, yes, yeah, which, yeah. which is a low tech community uh, that lives on a bridge that looks a little bit like a uh, Golden Gate, but yeah. I believe it's in Canada. I think it's a Toronto. It was all shot, okay. in, yeah, it was all shot in Toronto and Montreal. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. Um, Natasha, at this point, I want to ask a question because um, oh. the last the last couple of times, uh, or the last or a couple of times recently, we've been talking about films, and um, we've talked about films that have had kind of like fairly erratic and fairly kind of crazy plot beats going on and i think that a lot of the time we think that what kind of pulls it linear is one unwavering performance 
So like we <laughs> talked about the ninth configuration and we said that it was uh, Stacy Keach. Keach in that, and then we had Blackula um, last week. Oh sorry, yeah, yeah, William, Mar- William uh, Marshall and William Marshall in that. Where I think that like regardless of kind of like how high concept or strange or eccentric something can be, the kind of backbone of the thing can be provided by one kind of like unwavering normal performance. Mm-hmm. That kind of anchors it to reality. Do you think that there's one in this film? Zero. Correct, I believe. Zero. <laughs> it's absolute lunacy. And by the way, all of these actors are in different movies. <laughs> there is no unifying, you know, goal. There's no objective. There's no spine. Uh, yeah, no, there's zero. I mean, I would argue that Jones is the breakout star of the movie, but we'll we'll get there. Yeah. That's when it gets cranked all the way up to 11 but no there is no grounding no i don't i i, I, I it's like do you, i don't know if that's necessarily to its credit or its detriment it's just interesting i think that like where i think that like where i like to say when we're going through these films for this for the show i am watching a lot of them for the first time i haven't seen as many things as most people have to be honest and a lot of the time i think that like i kind of like my north star when i'm watching something that's mental is a kind of straight man performance that is, that definitely is and one. I just like, and I was just kind of curious to like whether or not anyone thought there was one because if there's a one. straight man, it's Takeshi. Yeah, I would agree. He's a man in charge of this gigantic criminal empire who has his own issues going on with the the dead daughter. Right, we get it. Your daughter's dead. Stop, stop going over it. Like, they, they, yeah, every yeah, fucking they, time we see you, right? they go that. Pretty, yeah. they go with that pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. they they plumb those that well. Like, but yeah, I would say Takeshi. If anyone is the straight guy. Yeah, I would say that's maybe, that's maybe true. Fair. That's true. He's he's pretty strange though. I mean, in that that initial scene, um, you know, oh, your Japanese is terrible. Let's speak English. Like it's it's pretty out there. It's pretty odd. Um, but yeah, I would say Takeshi is is pretty grounded. I mean, and yeah. he has a pretty pivotal role to play at the end as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and his his daughter died. That's important. It's an important plot piece. So I guess they want to make sure that they're hammering that in. <laughs> and they uh, do. Yeah. <laughs> so she died of the plague that, you know, is is the underlying issue because the the, the cure was not out. The the evil company did not allow the cure to be available to her, which True. is why she died. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I mean, it's an important plot point, I suppose. Yeah. Deserves some airtime, I guess. Do you know what I love? Go on. I love that people keep hitting Johnny in the head. What? Yeah. <laughs> people keep, like, attacking Johnny and hitting him in the head and people keep saying... Stop hitting him in the fucking head. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, too... he's the line. Udo Kier has the line. Don't yeah. what you hit him on the head for? <laughs> I just like that people just go for him and attack him, oblivious to the fact that his head's his I guess his the money. Yeah. And the original has been destroyed. So let's remember he has the last copy. Absolutely, they bought they bought it. Up. For... Yeah. Yeah, the stakes are high. They're as high as they can possibly get. Yep. And yeah, on the subject of Ralphie, though, it's like uh, we lose him pretty quick after this. Udo's death is amazing. He has a cool death, though. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I, th- I think I think that, like with that performance and that character, it earned a warrior's death, and it was a <laughs> <laughs> it was a pretty special death. A warrior's it death. <laughs> it was a warrior's death. I agree. He has a cooler death than the both of the villains. Yeah. Although I guess Dolph, the reveal at the end is pretty cool with Dolph. Do we want to talk about Dolph? I I, have, I admit Dolph is a bit much even for me. I feel well, not far off Dolph. I, I, feel uh, like, I feel like we can talk about Dolph anytime you want. Can I just point. say, <laughs> it, it's, at this t- it's at this point in my notes that I wrote, I wish I was watching Barbed Wire. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you don't mean that. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever watched anything that's maybe long for watching Barbed Wire. <laughs> No, it's a great death. But I was yeah, sorry to see you to Kirgo because he was obviously having a blast. Uh, and for anyone who obviously we spoil things all the time, uh, he he falls victim to the laser garrote. Uh, what was it you called it? His battle thumb. thumb. Battle thumb. <laughs> yeah. Shinji's battle thumb. Another awesome band name. Battle thumb. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, where where are we? Uh, we're around about the point where uh, they escape. And uh, Johnny starts uh, having all these flashes. He's getting seepage. Oh, uh, bear is mentioning that he's yeah, he's escaped with Jane. Yeah, important yeah, 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 character, yeah, yeah. and now, now she's kind of joined the fray. And yeah. yeah, they escape. Yeah, and you were saying. Yeah, and uh, he starts experiencing seepage. <laughs> uh, so, so, yes, seepage, as visually presented, is hilarious. By the way. Yeah. Yeah. Like I would say, it's one. It's one of the kind of like effects moments and things that kind of functions the worst. I would say for me. Okay. Yeah, it's like a pop seizure. 
it's like a pop art seizure um which uh yeah i mean he's having uh basically like a brain um uh like parts of his brain are getting fried right so yeah. we're we're visually seeing it as you know again that internet theme <laughs> cyberverse which is just like vaguely digital right it's like blue and it's grid yeah. it's a little bit tron uh, a little bit uh, digital, you know, ones and zeros. A long I dig one. It. An early Matrix. Yeah. Matrix went green. This movie is more blue and blue. silver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, what's her name? Uh, Jane lets him sleep, lets him sleep it off. And then they have an interaction which is incredibly badly acted. Um, where she's, <laughs> oh, yeah. Where she's kind of trying to just, just get the measure of the man. Uh, trying to figure out a little bit about him, a little bit about what's going on in his mind and who he is and what he is. And uh, she's like, "Do you have parent? Do you got parents and stuff?" And, <laughs> and Keanu, oh, it's so bad. He's like, "Do you got parents and stuff?" <laughs> oh, just, that's oh, a good for piano. fuck's sake, <laughs> just, yeah, say, someone, up. <laughs> someone, was, someone was practicing that in the mirror this morning. Yeah, right. you nailed it, man. That was great. Right. That was a great piano. <laughs> but uh, yeah, oh. and then we get into well, the. She hit a nerve, you know. She hit a nerve, so he he retorted, you know. He, yeah, he fired right back. It's so bad. Just gonna say, it might be important to also point out that the reason she's there is financial because she's having trouble getting work True. because of the black shakes. She's an unreliable bodyguard, so now she saves Keanu Johnny's life, uh, and he offers her a bunch of money. So she's basically now sticking with him so that she can get paid. Yeah, that's right. So it's a bit of, you know. He tries to get rid of her by saying, "Oh, just give me your account details, and I'll send you the money." And she's like, <laughs> "Don't think so." I don't think so. Come on, move. Which yeah, I think I, I think I, I would probably do the same thing. I think uh, like in this kind of post-apocalyptic dystopia, I think if somebody was like, "Yeah, give me your details and I'll wire you the money," I'd be like, "No, <laughs> I'm not for that." She's been around the block. I mean, her threshold for bullshit is pretty low. Pretty quickly after this, we get the scene in Crazy Bob's computer store, <laughs> where <laughs> the dialogue, like like you mentioned earlier, Natasha, the dialogue just becomes absolute gobbledygook. Every yeah, bit of it. Stuff. It's just a bunch of future nonsense and tech <laughs> stuff just plucked from various places and mashed together. When he's got those, he's got his goggles on. Don't and his you gloves. love the hands though? The the POV, the like VR POV. Yeah. It's, I love that. He's yeah. got little claws for some reason. <laughs> that to me was yeah. the, the moment that I thought, "Fuck that!" This is like the Lawnmower Man. That was the moment that really made me yeah. think of the Lawnmower Man. And I think there are a lot of kind of similarities to the Lawnmower Man. They loved this shit in the nineties. They really yeah, did. they did. They really yeah. did. I always found it kind of nightmarish, and I think that was part of what fascinated me so much was the idea of being trapped in that awful world. Yeah. What was, but that imagery really is very powerful, and it goes, it's through so much in the '90s, right? From from pop shit like this to you know really experimental art. Everyone was kind of playing around with that idea of a cyber world that is parallel to our world yeah. um and it's kind of nightmarish like it's not a very fun <laughs> it's not like a steve jobs like white heaven apple place it's like kind of horrifying Dirty. which is cool yeah. Yeah. grimy yeah dystopian it's a wild west out there and he has his hacker friend who we only see this like very distorted image of strike uh strike what a cool name <laughs> i'm gonna change my online handle to strike <laughs> uh, but he's cool too you know he's his buddy he's a hacker so they hack some shit <laughs> i kind of feel like i was like oh, i'm gonna do this later but i'm gonna bring up the full list of character names in this okay because i just realized that we're, we're talking about a film that has characters called j-bone spider, spider and strike, strike. And it's like yeah i want to see the full set yeah i'm pretty sure by the way to go back to uh to ralphie's um uh bodyguards i'm pretty sure i saw that one is named pretty and the other one is named yo mama like, <laughs> no. her name is actually i'm yo gonna mama. guess which one's your mama i'm gonna yeah uh... no you know exactly who's your mama <laughs> <laughs> incredible so anyway <laughs> please go on <laughs> uh, uh so right pre pre pretty much right at this point <laughs> and then i'm gonna just step back because i can't even talk about him because he's so ridiculous would introduce the street preacher. Yes, it's at this point yeah. that we find out that the Yakuza has enlisted, like, the Yakuza are after Johnny, <laughs> and they have enlisted the help of the Church of the Retransfiguration. Oh, fuck. Right, okay. That's, that's right. Yeah. It? yeah. Is it? <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel like, I feel like we should spend a little bit of time on, uh, 
on that. yeah he's wild how long have you he's got really oh. wild. Oh. and apparently he didn't do a film after this until the expendables that's true so this, this- yeah, this was that was his last theatrical release fifty uh, film for fifteen years after this. Yeah, and I, I you can understand why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like when I, when I read that because I did a little bit of reading before we came in to do this, and when I read that, it was like I was like he did this, and then it was fifteen year gap before it was a theatrical, and then it was what? Expendables, what? and then That's I looked at it and I, was like, and I was like, well, you know, like the laws, like you know, that checks out in a lot of ways. He is a post human. He play, that character, Street Preacher is a post-human. He's uh, changed his his physical body so many times that he is no longer even, you know, really human anymore. Okay. Uh, which is kind of a cool idea. I was just going to uh, say, it's quite, like, like, conceptually, that's quite smart. I like it. It is. It is cool. So, you know, we were saying before that all the characters are in different movies. I mean, this dude is, like, in a different <laughs> genre of movie. He is, like, way off the off the range, you know, off the ranch. So... Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure it's going to be tough to defend him, but, um, I think they needed like a really scary bad guy that also is going to appeal to their Western audience. So uh-huh. I think like the Yakuza is, is a great baddie for, um, so this movie had a huge Japanese audience It actually premiered in Japan first and there's like a different cut and it's, you know, whatever. And so I just have a feeling that Dolph and the street preacher is for, uh, dumb Americans who are like, well, I don't get it, you know? Um, so he's like a scary preacher. That's simultaneously, I think, is like that's an interesting point, and I think you're probably right. But also, like introducing that character as being the kind of like the island in the ocean of unfamiliar things that a Western audience could be like, oh yeah, this guy, okay, yeah, I can relate <laughs> to this guy. Dolph also gets second billing, and he's and he I, I think he's may maybe got ten minutes of screen time, if that. I think that's generous. I think it's yeah. less. Yeah, he does take out Henry Rollins, which is tragic. Um, yeah. I think Henry Rollins left a movie way too early. I think he should have been in more. But yeah, he's a bad dude. He's into like uh, nailing people, like Jesus on the cross. Crucifying. More hand right. trauma. Yeah, more hand trauma. That's right. That's right. But you know what? He's got style. He's got a thing. He looks truly deeply ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> He does. The wig leaves a lot to be desired. Yeah, he, and he has facial hair, I think. Yeah, he's got a beard. Yeah, yeah he's, he's got a beard, yeah. But uh, yeah, truly deeply, deeply, deeply ridiculous. And he's augmented, he clunks, he clicks, and he whirls like a robot. Yeah. Um, oh, but it's so bad. Well, I think he's 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 got, um he's enhanced in every way. So he's physically enhanced, so he's stronger and faster and all those things. But I think he's also, I think the reason he's supposed to be kind of crazy is because he has messed with his brain so much to make his reflexes faster and whatever, whatever. Um, so that's part of why he's become like a religious nut. But yeah, he's astonishing. He is astonishing. <laughs> yeah. It's a truly baffling character. Yeah, I kind of almost wish I kind of almost wish that it spent a, that, that, that it spent more time on him. I'd rather I'd like to see the film of him. I think I'd I think I'd like to know more about how he got to where he was and kind of things. I think that like like yeah, there's a, like there's a lot of things wrong performance wise and like the look of it and things. But I think like it's kind of interesting and I would like to know a little more. Street preacher origin story. Even, yeah, it's a, it's a million dollar idea. Even a comic book. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would dig that. I mean, I think his look is also pretty cool. Like, um, he's got like the sweeping robes. And he's somehow found like tattered linen, um, sort of like this Jesus-like material yeah. out of which to craft his robes. Like I think he probably made his own clothes. You know, I don't know where you picked that up. So, yeah, he's he is kind of cool. He's got a cool knife. He's got like a crucifix yeah, knife. Um, we mm-hmm. get a scene yeah. where um, we find out that uh, Jane uh, has nerve attenuation syndrome. Um, and she starts trembling and shaking, and Johnny's trembling and shaking. And uh... <laughs> this, is, this is the first real look that we get of the kind of like physical symptoms of nerve attenuation syndrome, isn't it? Like in depth. Yeah, it's like an extended seizure. She yeah. kind of goes through. Um, and they're advised at that point to take, or Johnny's advised to take uh, Jane to see Spider. So we kind of get a glimpse of Spider's world, his little lab and stuff like that. And Rollins here chews the scenery so, so much. I had it in my notes that, Ro- that uh, Rollins' speech here is his, mo- is his most black flag moment in the film. Yeah, it's like that. this is the moment that's like going to see Henry Rollins the most doing spoken word, which I've done twice. Yeah. Spoken word, yeah. It's, it's, it's weird. Tony's at his angriest. Yeah. He is, but I responded to it. I was like, fuck yeah, we need some energy, you know? And I think he really brought it. And, and Keanu kind of fades from the movie at that point a little bit. I think Henry Rollins really takes over and he's explaining what's going on and, and all the, the technology, man, it's making us sick. But here we are using it anyway. And I was like, yeah, 
16 year old me was like fuck yeah <laughs> yeah. Rollins. yeah just johnny just johnny just, just johnny that's right that's his little nickname oh oh uh, just johnny yeah, that's I feel like you're hitting on something there, like because I think that Lee he does have to do a lot of the a lot of the heaviest lifting with the kind of the bare bones bullet points of this thing. Yeah, and it's an extremely hard film to bullet point into points that can be explained away in dialogue. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah. That, like, yeah, I, th- I think that yeah, like Rollins is probably more of a backbone to this thing than I probably gave him credit for going in, like coming in. No, he's hugely important. He also, um, yeah, he explains a lot of things, including like the ultimate solution. Um, but I just want to say that uh, the problem of NAS is uh, humans' overexposure to technology, right? Yes. And um, the cure is a cure to the plague, and yet we are led. We assume that at the end of this movie, everyone goes on and just continues using the technology. So oh, sure. yeah. there's. Obviously, you know, the if if the message is let's unplug, that's clearly not what ends up happening. So I'm just saying Henry Rollins was out there preaching and nobody nobody was listening to him. So R.I.P. Spider. R.I.P. Spider. I, I, would, I would I would agree. I was sad to see Spider go. Uh, Me too. I really was. Um and then we get uh, more or less right after this you get Keanu's monologue. Oh. This is the centerpiece, but- I feel. I'll just leave that this, hanging that. like the bad smell that it is because it's terrible. No, Natasha, I want your take on this. Like, cause, this, cause I feel like I feel like Keanu's performance and the film are kind of like this feels like the culmination of a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's insane. I mean, it comes from nowhere. Uh, I think in the in the course of the film, you're meant to believe that he's just like fed up, but there's no escalation to that point. <laughs> um, there's no, like emotionally, you know, like as an actor, he is completely flatlined the entire way until it suddenly jumps all the way up to a hundred, and he's there and he's screaming on this dirt mound underneath a, a bridge with the burning wreckage of their van behind him, and he, um, I guess, in a moment of vulnerability declares how he wants all of the luxuries of life, including a $10,000 hooker and room service, which is my favorite um, <laughs> line. That's he incredible. has two great declarations. He has one yeah. before <laughs> that I think people don't uh, quote enough, which is he gets real close and he goes, I need a computer, which is oh, yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> but like- this is truly, truly remarkable work because it's this wide shot and you're kind of looking up at him slightly. There's like a sky skyline behind him. It's night. It's dramatic. And he spreads his arms and he goes, I want room service. <laughs> and um, I think we've all been there, you know, like we can yeah. all really relate to him I in w- that moment. Yeah. I want my shots laundered like they do at the Imperial yeah. Hotel in Tokyo. <laughs> 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 I think I'll put the whole monologue in the episode just so people can hear it in its entirety. Well, we'll put a, I'll put a break in here and we'll put the whole the whole monologue in. If that's something we I can really do. I really think you I should. Think. Yeah, yeah, that's something I, really I can do. I've got the technology. I can do that. Listen. You listen to me. You see that city over there? That's where I'm supposed to be. Not down here with the dogs and the garbage and the fucking last month's newspapers blowing back and forth! I've had it with them! I've had it with you! I've had it with all this! I want room service! I want the club sandwich! I want the cold Mexican beer! I want a $10,000 a night hooker! I want my shirts laundered. Like they do at the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. I I mean, I'll never be able to do it justice. I just love that it comes out of nowhere. Like there is no, um, there's no preamble. He just launches right into it. And poor Jane is just sitting there and for some reason is like, uh, very, uh, 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 it makes her romantically interested in him, which is completely batshit. I was going to say, that's um, kind of fascinating in and of itself, isn't it? Well, he could, I mean, I don't know what, what it, uh, I guess he's bearing his innermost desires to her, <laughs> but uh, his vulnerability. But um, 
yeah, it's completely batshit. And it also kind of establishes him like as as beyond an anti-hero. I mean, he really he doesn't really uh, give a shit about anything. Oh, he just man. wants his shirts laundered the way they do at the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. Yep. She's, yep, that's that. Yeah, that's she's won piece. over by Keanu's approximation of passion. Yes. Right? Yeah, which is basically kind of like yeah, just kind of like a blind lust for material things that are kind of characterized as being normal. Yeah. And he just sits down at the end too. The, they keep they hold on the shot. They keep the camera rolling, and exhausted by this outburst, um, Keanu just kind of sits and sighs, dejected. You know. Yeah. yeah. I I just love it. I think it's hilarious. I think it's absolutely hilarious. I I think it's like it's an honor. It, it's the crowning. Yeah, I think so. But it's like, I th- I think it's the crowning moment of the piece. Oh really? I think. really? Oh, absolutely. The crowning glory. Yeah. I I I. I, I There's I, one moment that is more that is more astonishing <laughs> that okay. we have yet to get to. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think I might, about, know, I think, I think I might know what you mean. We're about to come yeah. on to it. So again, what we meet, J Bone, J Bone. Uh, who, who has, by the way, the anarchy sign tattooed on his forehead, which how, I think is an important thing That's how thing you know he's a badass. Out. That's how you know he's, yeah. he's a badass. Uh, he says, look, I've got somebody that can help you here. I'm going to take you and introduce you to Jones, who is a code breaker and a junkie and a dolphin. <laughs> As it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> and that is worth just letting, giving it a minute to percolate. Yeah, it's a dolphin. It's a dolphin. Um, it's the best. It's the best. <laughs> it's just groundbreaking. Groundbreaking. Not only- and by the way, that's another spider tip. It's 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 a <laughs> T-bone, but it's also or J-bone, um, but it's spider. It's Henry Rollins who tells them, "Make sure you go see Jones." So again, we have Henry Rollins to thank. <laughs> Thanks, Rollins. Yeah, no, I I think like honestly, um, again, like I say watching this for the first time two nights ago. I think uh, some of the things that kind of made the kind of the second act of this film feel like a little bit of a slog for me on first watch was <laughs> that it felt like, because um, I mean, I, I was kind of like, oh, this film's mental. But all, but in a, in a way that like, I was kind of like, yeah, okay. But it didn't grab me that much. And I, I, there was basically a lot of stuff that I kind of felt was kind of arbitrary and not particularly entertaining. And then see when it got to, when it's like, oh, it's Jones, and Jones is like a dolphin with like what appeared to be like a like a headset, mm-hmm. and it's a code breaker, but it's a dolphin. I was like, you know what? Yeah, okay, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. because it kind of felt like mm-hmm. it was like a it was it felt like the most authentic embracing <laughs> of the eccentricity of the thing. It started like, to in make that, sense in that one moment where you saw it. I was like, yes, this this is what yeah. I'm here for. It's like yeah. I, I felt like it was it felt like it kind of like everything about the film that I thought was kind of middling at that point kind of leveled up in one moment. Absolutely agreed. It's truly when it embraces the insanity, just 150% goes in. Um, Also, the sound effects, like I think the first shot of the reveal, it has like this delightful little flipper sound. And that scene is just magical. I mean, I don't know if you guys can find an audio clip from it. but I I can do that. I need to make it work. It's really special. Codebreaker. Good. Can't wait to meet him. Right this way. Jones. It's a fish. Jones Jones is a great reveal. One of my top ten reveals, I would say, in, in the history of film. <laughs> it's actually yes. Jones that makes me check out the most. Oh really? I'm By like, the way. No. <laughs> I'm like a dolphin. You don't no. like dolphins? <laughs> uh, no, I've got, absolutely I've, I've Andy, said it before. Andy, Andy, the fuck's your problem with dolphins? <laughs> they're very intelligent you know yeah, no, I've got no problem with them um, apart from um, <laughs> they've got a gang mentality that troubles me <laughs> um, I, I would say that's my it's biggest heroin that's my biggest this one uh, this... did like did, did something happen at SeaWorld no 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 I, I wouldn't go to SeaWorld purely on mor- <laughs> and moral uh, on moral grounds yeah. but I don't Agreed. have a, I don't have a problem with dolphins let me just clarify that okay I think dolphins are majestic I think they're uh, I think they're wonderful creatures. Um, they're the they're the cows of the sea. Um, right. Or, well, no, a whale would be the cow of a sea. Maybe a dolphin's like the goat of the sea, or a donkey. Right. Just just carry on. <laughs> but I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with dolphins at all. Right. I think dolphins are lovely. Yes. What I have a problem with is the fact that this dolphin becomes the de facto, the de facto hero of the film. 
this dolphin has more impact on the outcome of this film yep. than Johnny does mm-hmm. or than mm-hmm. anyone else in the film does. This dolphin is the hero, the saviour of the of the piece. Yep. Hell yeah, he is. Yep. I failed to see the problem. I just... <laughs> And all the actors, God bless them, are doing an amazing job at keeping a straight face. Yeah, right. I, I, everyone, poker, to... over, everyone poker faces it pretty well, yeah. I think. There is a moment, yeah. Ice-T looks like he's struggling at one point when he's right next to the tank. But I, 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 and I wrote it down, I was like, Ice-T hates acting beside this dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, he manages to get through it. And okay, we, we can suspend our disbelief with the science that Jones was developed to hack submarines I'm yes like, yeah that's, that's true, yeah. the science of his helmet is to swim up and kind of read what's happening on on, on submarine right. computers you you would think that they would pick a, a deep sea animal like an octopus <laughs> um but i guess there's something about a dolphin dolphins. i guess they're, i don't know dolphins, dolphins are more like you know they're higher up in the ocean they're yeah, not like they're, going they're surface surface dwellers <laughs> it's a fair observation though <laughs> yeah I don't know. I think it'd be a big surprise. Well, I, I don't know this again. This, my research didn't extend to anything beyond the the kind of memory capabilities of the human brain. But if anyone wants to tweet us with the exact kind of how deep a submarine can go versus a dolphin, yeah, that would be that would be good. You know, it's not fun. Presumably, yeah. though, a dolphin could wait till a till a submarine's on the ascent. Yeah, you're and, right. And then go you're right, right. Now's my window mm-hmm. and. Kind of right. Take the... Yeah, and and they look pretty friendly. So, like, presumably, like a Soviet sub wouldn't, you know, they'd be like, "Oh, dolphins, how how nice." They don't really have. Yeah, no, totally, submarines yeah. don't really have windows, though. No, but... <laughs> so, so Jones Jones could act in relative. The subterfuge would would last, I think. Um, guys, right. I, like, we it's possible that we're overthinking this. <laughs> Maybe. I think it demands. <laughs> it demands analysis. Agreed. Um, I, I will also say it's very troubling because they uh, they sort of insinuate that Jones has been intentionally hooked on drugs, uh, on heroin or, or something. Uh, yeah, like, so yeah, that's that a... they, he's been intentionally um, uh, uh, given uh, heroin so that he develops a heroin addiction yeah. and is therefore more easily controlled. Um, which I think is really insidious. Oh, little yeah. detail. And uh, it's kind of horrible now you say it. Yeah. Ice T says that they keep injecting him so that uh, he thinks he's swimming. Right. Which is dark. That's pretty tragic. Dark. Yeah. Yeah, that is actually. Yeah. But he is the hero. He fries. Um, uh, well, spoilers. Uh, Dolph shows up. The street creature arrives. <gasps> mm-hmm. Yeah. Go, yep. go on. But yep. I've just had a revelation. No, Karen. There you go. Yeah, well, he, he, he arrives and is wreaking havoc as they're trying to sort of resolve this fucking movie. And um, Jones Jones is weaponized, in addition to being super a super spy. He is also weaponized. So, I mean, Jones can do it all. I'm a big fan of Jones. Yeah. There's a poetry to Dolph versus Dolphin. <laughs> Best of life. <laughs> that, I find that quite warming. Um, in fact, I've changed my whole opinion of the film just on the fact that the villain is named Dolph, and the hero is a dolphin. The villain's not really named Dolph. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> they should do a poster that's Dolph versus Dolphin. I'll and Photoshop. they could do like a face-off poster. Yeah. I'll Photoshop one together. I'd be in for that. Um, so yeah, let, I'm, I'm going to try and drive this to the actual <laughs> end of the film. Can I just quickly touch on the, the, the computer head, the ghost in the machine head thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, she's well, important. Yeah, because we haven't touched on this at all. Who is she? What, yeah, what is she? Well... Well, wound throughout the story is is another great Gibson um, um, concept, which is she's the former CEO of the pharmaceutical company right. who, um, when she died, so in, in this world, uh, Switzerland has very loose rules about sort of like um, you can do whatever you want. It's like, again, sort of like a neutral place. So <laughs> in theory, most of the world has rules about uploading a brain or an entity or whatever. So they, they go out of their way in the movie to point out that she had Swiss, her her um, consciousness had a Swiss national uh, citizenship. So she was able to have her brain uploaded into the computer servers of the company. And so now she kind of like wanders around and um, bothers beat Takeshi and she's like, hey, Get your act together. So she's very important. She's trying to warn everyone. I feel like there's a connection yeah. with her and Johnny. Do you think? 
Yeah, I don't know. I feel like she she knows Johnny somehow. She's all fair with Johnny and his activities. You think? Yeah, I do think. Any- I don't. There is a shot of there's a reveal at the end of the film of his mother, and she does kind of look like her. Oh. I think it's meant to be her. If that's what you're getting at. Well, I've Andy, written I here. That's where you're going with that. Is she Johnny's mum? Oh, did you, did you have that written down? I've written that there. I was, okay. I've written the ghost head thing. Is that Johnny's mum? Is that your instinct? Do you I feel strongly weirdly, that that's the case? Well, I, I can't. And then I was trying to wrap my head around it. I was like, how could it be? Surely Johnny's just done. There's nothing particularly special about him. In fact, as we've already touched on, he's arguably a low level courier. Like. <laughs> Yeah, cause, yeah, compared to the other couriers that might be out there, yeah, it's possible. He makes a pizza delivery joke, but I think I feel like it's kind of apropos to Johnny's level as a courier. <laughs> like, it could be, like, he's the kind of pizza delivery level courier. The delivery guys who can go up to, like, 500 gigs, right? Like, those are, like, the top level guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Johnny's just chilling with his 80 gigs. <laughs> what a loser. <laughs> Um, yeah, she she's trying to send a message to him because she knows what's in his head. So she's kind of the through line, um, and she helps him in the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, she reaches through the through the net. Maybe I'm right. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I have no idea. I guess we could look at the casting, right? We could look and see if the woman who's credited as Johnny's mother is, is the same actress, if and then we would know. If her son uh, name's Mnemonic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna try and do this. I'm gonna just. I'm gonna try and bring okay. up the cast list. So, um, well, I'm gonna go on just to talk about go back to Dolph Lundgren because he he's amazing in this whole this whole scene when he uh, when he declares that it's Jesus time. <laughs> I don't know. He does. I don't That's know. His catchphrase. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe because you're going to you're going to Jesus because he's going to kill you. Yeah, yeah. Um, or he's going to crucify you like Jesus. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Of course, that's his shtick. Yeah, you've answered my question. That's it. Yeah, I don't know. He moves in mysterious ways, Dolph. Yeah, as the old saying goes, Dol- Dolph moves in mysterious ways. <laughs> <laughs> Why is he just called Street Preacher? It sounds like they weren't, they couldn't be bothered writing a that, character name. Yeah. Uh, no, he's, he's, um, he's credited as Carl Honig. Oh. Uh-oh. Well. Wow. <laughs> I thought his name was Street Preacher. Yeah. Wow. I, mean, I had like, no idea. That's Carl. news to me. But yeah, no, he's, he's, he's credited as Carl Honig. There you go. Fuck that my... is a creepy name. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Pretty good. So, um, yeah, let's, but let's kind of, let's kind of get the actual plot of this over the finish line. Sorry, Mitch. Sorry. No, it's cool. <laughs> I know you like order. Yeah, exactly. I no. crave this order. Um, because eventually kind of like <laughs> all kind of comes good in the end. Yeah. To a large extent. Jones comes to the rescue and busts Dolph's implants and then turns them into With the help of Jane. Yeah. With Jane, Jane comes back in, yeah. Yep. And then uh, Dolph kind of turns into a... Kind of gets electrocuted and, and it becomes a fireball and a kind of burnt up corpse. It's a good burn effect. It's a good stunt, actually. Um, it's a full body burn, which is always mm-hmm. fun. I mean, I, I will say, I think the the stunts and the um, the visual effects, the practical effects, and everything are, are stand up pretty well. Yes. Um, there's nothing too horribly transparent, and and I think it would be harder to watch um, <laughs> if the effects also were terrible. But I think the uh, the effects are pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, I'd be inclined to agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, Johnny has to hack his own brain while, I believe, while <laughs> Dolph is there. Well, so Street Preacher attacks um, while Johnny is attempting to, and I believe it's Ice-T who tells him, you got to hack your own brain. So he does with the help of the AI and um, while they're fighting off Street Preacher. So it's kind of all culminates in this wild scene. It's quite a final scene, actually. It's there's a lot going on. Yeah, I was gonna say there's a lot of kind of like there's a a lot of kind of a lot of kind of plot strands need settling up, and what is a very action heavy scene. Well, yeah, you get the yeah the yakuza show back up. Yeah, 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 they do. Yeah, yeah. You get the death of Shinji. You get the death of Takahashi. Um, in fact, Shinji winds up uh, the victim of the uh, what the fuck's it called again? What what did they call it? <laughs> battle thumb. I was going to call it mega thumb. No, but, battle thumb. Yeah, battle thumb. Uh, it's yeah. also mega. Mega works too. Uh, he, get, he loses his head to to the battle thumb. 
Um, no, Battle, like Battle Thumb versus Mega Thumb is the second film in the spin-off series that I'm working on in my I head right now. That. I would totally watch that. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense that in the future, like the Yakuza would have access to like really cool um, like battle enhancements. So um, I had no problem with the Battle Thumb. I was all about it. No, me absolutely. too. And yeah. if there's a film that brings that back, then I'll, I'll watch it. I also mm. like the fact they had a kind of... It's like a car aerial, like an extendable car aerial with a blade on the end. A few people had them, and they would use them. Mm -hmm. They they were kind of like whipping them at at folk. Like Those were kind of cool. Yeah, the weapons were cool. They were cool. And I think he kills kills Takahashi. Yeah, because... So, right. So, Takahashi confronts Johnny... Mm-hmm. And Johnny boasts, you know, you can't, you can't shoot me, which is true. And then, of course, not the answer the is not in the head, right? Which, which he delivers, Beat Takeshi uh, delivers so beautifully. But then I believe he's betrayed by his own number two. By Shinji, yeah, that's yeah, true. By Shinji. So uh, he meets a tragic end. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, he just gets shot. That's right. Yeah. I was trying to remember what happens to him. And then he, he helps Johnny out. Yeah. He gets redemption. Uh, later. He finds redemption. Yes, he's and the fact that he is able to help spread this, um, because the cure they don't just the cure gets pretty much sent to everyone. The cure gets spread around the whole world. Oh, yeah, I feel like it's important to hit on the fact that that's what he was carrying. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> no, the, the, the cure for nervous attenuation syndrome was the data that he was he was carrying. Continue. I just wanted to. <laughs> but yeah, Johnny uh, hacks his own brain and spreads the cure around the whole world, essentially to to everyone who might need it. To every corner of the globe, um, <laughs> he does a yeah, he does a good thing. And then to, I love I love that to visually represent that the uh, the tower of the company just <laughs> bursts into flames. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that always cracks me up. That shit uh, is hilarious. That shit is hilarious. <laughs> I don't know where that happened. I was watching it and I was like, it was like you know when you kind of feel like there's a scene missing. Yeah. Or, you know, like, yeah. like, just like well, yeah, a you, frame missing or something. You just, you look out and there's a building on fire from a distance and you're just like, oh, it's all, it's all gone wrong. I don't yeah. know what's happening here. But then you pull in, they do like a real, a real kind of close, close shot of the Pharmacon logo ablaze. Yeah. And um, you know that we've won. The good guys have won. Good guys yes, have won. I believe the low techs, ironically, are the ones who spread it. <laughs> so the, the low tech people um use the net to spread the information to everyone so that it is you know accessible to anyone who needs it as you said Mm -hmm. um so william gibson coined the phrase cyberspace he did he did he's a genius a factoid for you that's not i didn't know that obviously inevitably i didn't know that that's (laughs) he did with neuromancer with his with the first novel neuromancer i think it's like 1982 1983 or something i don't know i probably shouldn't say numbers without knowing it but um <laughs> yeah no, that's yeah he coined a lot of phrases i mean he he's just very cool i mean he basically single-handedly created the cyberpunk thing um or at least he made it really legit and um interesting and artistic uh so i don't know uh people out there don't let this creepy weird movie uh turn you off from william gibson stuff because he's awesome <laughs> <laughs> it is weird yeah, whatever else it is, it is weird. It is weird. Um, Natasha, this was a re- the, this was a really interesting selection. I would not go as far as to say that I've enjoyed it, <laughs> but um, I think that like I, I I it's again it's one of those things where like I never come away from the conversation feeling like any of it's been a waste of my time, mm-hmm. and I think that like. <laughs> Um, and like, and yeah, I feel like, uh, I want to go and I want, I definitely, I want to read the short story for a start. I think it's very different. It's very different. Yeah. I'd be quite curious to know just kind of like what the starting point was versus the film we ended up getting. (laughs) Um, but, um, just like a question for you, obviously, and we'll get to this in a sec, but obviously, um, you're a filmmaker yourself and you were talking earlier about how you thought this would have been more interesting if it had been made on a smaller budget. If it was in your hands, what kind of film would you make for this? Oof. It's so funny you say that because when I was rewatching it before talking with you guys, I was like, damn, I would love to fucking remake this movie <laughs> and make it really cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you, uh, I think it would be really awesome to just totally embrace the anti matrixness of it. So to embrace the goofiness, the color, the, um, all the things that we are laughing at in a, uh, out of control way. 
and make it really controlled and fun. Um, but still, like the dark, like it's very violent. I, you know, I think all the violence needs to stay in place for sure. Uh, I think the story is more from the bodyguard's perspective, and I think that would be a lot more interesting. So that the movie actually starts with this sort of busted bodyguard who's looking for a new client, and then she kind of comes along, Johnny needing help, and then they join forces, and that's kind of our entry point into the story. Yeah, I mean, I think it's cool. I think cyberpunk is awesome, and it's super relevant now, and it's time for a rebirth of cyberpunk. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be a really fun challenge. I don't yeah. know if that answers your question at all. It does, but it yeah, needs no. to be big. I, I don't think you can. I mean, I think there's a reason they couldn't do it for a million oh, five. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's way too big. It's too crazy. You need the effects. You need the. You need Keanu. I mean, I would love for Keanu to come back. Yeah. Would you bring him back as Johnny or would you put him in a, an ancillary role? I think Johnny has to be like a punk, like a young punk. So I think he would he would need to be a different role. But it would be a nice spider? little cameo for him. Oh, yeah, spider. spider. Yeah. He could totally be spider. Yeah, definitely. He could totally be spider. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Andy, yeah. you were a vocal, you were a vocal critic of this going in. What have you, what, what have you taken out of this tonight? <clears throat> well, um, Again, similar to, <laughs> similar to yourself, right? Right. I rarely come into these conversations, and then I leave liking the film less. Weirdly, once you kind of sit and you dissect it with people, you kind of warm to it slightly more. Mm -hmm. However, still don't particularly like it. I mean, I was when this came out. When this came out, I would have been fifteen or sixteen at the time, and um. I was mad into films like this, like I, like I mentioned, Judge Dredd and mm -hmm. Bob Wire, Tank Girl, Strange Days, all the kind of things that I mentioned. I was mad into these things, and I remember watching this at the time, and I'd see obviously seen um, Keanu and a bunch of other things, like even going way back to things like Parenthood, um, and I remember thinking, "Jeez, this guy's fucking bad." Like <laughs> he's great at playing that kind of <laughs> dude thing uh like in parenthood and bill and ted he's great at that but when he actually tries to act i was like fuck man he's really bad here and i'd seen speed which he's not mm. great in but he doesn't have that much to do but in this he's got quite a fair amount of weight to humph about and uh i watched it didn't like it and then i'd say where are we now ten, maybe 10 years ago I revisited it again when I went through a phase of watching these exact same kind of films. <laughs> and I remember going, God, he's really bad. I don't like this film. Oh, there's a dolphin. <laughs> Checked out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's really interesting that you exited at the point in the dolphin. Because like, the, 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 the well, dolphin, like, like, uh, the, the dolphin was my point where I kind of like, I was, I, it, it, took, <laughs> it, it took that long. But the dolphin was the point where I went all in. I exit a lot earlier yeah. than that. Yeah. I exit a lot earlier than that. I said earlier, but there's these little glimmers of hope that keep me watching. The these little <laughs> moments, these little moments where I'm like, ah, oh, hang on, this could get good here, and then I'm like, no, wait, remember, it doesn't. It doesn't get really any better than this. And then when Dolph... well, speaking of of strange days and and Keanu and all that, do you like him in in uh, Point Break? Well, Point Point Break. Are you a Point Break? And Point yeah. Break, he's still playing that. He's only a tiny fraction removed from from Ted. Bill and Ted. <laughs> like, he's, like you could kind of chart a course from Bill and Ted through Parenthood into Point Break, and he's still there. He's still there, and I feel like the first one of the I'd say one of the first roles where he kind of stepped out of that was uh, Speed. But even then, mm -hmm. it's still there. It's still lurking in the background <laughs> of every line. Yeah. And... I think he was very confused by this script. I, I would, uh, I would. <laughs> you can see that. You can see that in his face. Yeah, it's his audition tape for the Matrix too. Is like how he can exist in in a in a punk world, like a cyberpunk world. Um, I do, I do have one note for for Longo, Mr. Longo, which is I think uh, I think Johnny's outfit could be way cooler. It's kind of just like this very blah '90s, like too baggy suit, and I think they could have made it way cooler. That is, so. that's that's a fair share. Well, he, that's yeah, yeah, it's yeah. traceable. So much yeah. for our remake. We'll we'll he'll have a really cool, like futuristic, like courier suit. Um, so. Can I can I, make, be, can I make a casting choice for Johnny? Oh, okay. Suggestions, please, please. Um, uh, just because, like, Natasha's got a pad. Just, um, just yeah, be, just because of how good I thought he was in a trash fire. 
uh, Adrian Grenier. Okay. Interesting. Oh, okay. interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm open to other suggestions. Curious. I like it. And I mean, obviously, right. inevitably, if I'm mentally casting something, I'm going to have to find a space for David Strathairn, but... Let's not, That's get a whole your, right. let's not get into your love again of David Strathairn. Every episode. I also am obsessed with David Strathairn. So Thank you. I David Strathairn's I great. Wait, he, he features way too much on this podcast. <laughs> considering, <laughs> considering, considering he's been in zero films that we've done so far, I do find ways to work him into the conversation way too frequently. I'm sure he, appreci- he appreciates that. He, we, we <laughs> he will, will be in he, the movie too. He will when we get him on. <laughs> Oh no, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. You'd be like, you'd I want to know who. I want to know what bad movie he wants to defend because I, I, I really am curious to know. I would love to know that. I would love to know. I'm that. still waiting for someone to bring on a film that they've either directed or been in because that's, that's <laughs> the dream. I think that would be fucking amazing. Yeah, I would just love someone that. to savage a film that, like, for Ty West to come on and rip the piss out of Cabin Fever too. <laughs> oh, that yeah. would be funny. Oh man. Well, give me a call in 10 years. I'm sure I'll have a fifteen years. <laughs> I just want to quickly say there is a parallel to be drawn between uh, Johnny Mnemonic and The Matrix because I feel like uh, Johnny, has character, uh, he uses Smith as his name. Yes. And he's dressed, yeah, he he's does. dressed in a black suit, and white shirt, black tie. Is he the proto-Agent Smith? Um, Whoa. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I love it. He is the first Smith. There you go. Maybe. Who knows? But I still don't like. I still don't particularly like this film. Natasha, before we wrap up, I want to take a minute to talk about uh, Imitation Girl. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah no, sorry. It's um. <laughs> so it's available in the UK now. Yeah. You might have heard of it. Um. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. People. Like, <laughs> um. People could watch it on Amazon Prime mm-hmm. now, and uh, they definitely should. I saw it at Fright Fest last year. Um, awesome. That's screening. a really fun screening. Oh, oh, I'm glad you thought so. I thought, it was, I mean, I love the film. Thank you. As Thank you. I. Thank you, guys. Yes, no, you guys have been really supportive. We really appreciate it. With a little film, every every voice is heard and every voice is super important. So thank you so much. Um, do you want to take a, Do you want to take a sec to just kind of talk about it a little bit for people that might be listening that haven't seen it? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, it's a science fiction movie. We're we're a small science fiction movie starring the incredible Lauren Ashley Carter. Uh, who people may remember from The Woman or Drug Face or Mind's Eye or Darling, any number of her awesome films. Um, she is amazing. And she is amazing. So she plays two roles. She plays um, a real girl living in New York, uh, and then she plays an alien being who sort of falls to Earth and takes the form of the other girl. So um, it's kind of two separate stories that are interwoven and um, yeah, it's my first feature film, and it was an experience, and it's been really, really great um, meeting everyone along the way. Uh, we are we're being distributed by um, Dread Central Presents label, which is part of Epic Pictures, and we're working with the super, super awesome Rob G, who's heading up the yeah. label, and he is totally kick ass. So yeah, check it out. No, I, I would big say, love there for yeah. Rob. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Big love for Rob. Yeah, no, um, no, like I said, I, I, I thought it was great. Yeah. It was, it was one of my favorite things I saw at the festival that that year, and just out of anything I saw that year. Thank you, and and Fright Fest was great for us actually. Um, I really, really enjoyed the festival. I wish I could go this year. I don't know if you guys are planning to go. We are, um, yeah, we are going. Awesome, yeah, yeah. So, and Paul McAvoy, one of the one of the directors of the festival, was a really a champion for us. So, um, we're really, really grateful to have screened there, and we had a great screening. And, um, you know, I think it is. It, this is something, you know, I hate I hate to talk about this all the freaking time, but it is special to have female led stories mm-hmm. yeah. um, in genre. And it was really, really great to um, see people of all different kinds of backgrounds, genders, whatever, um, sort of respond to the film. So. Um, yeah, it, it's been really kind of a surprising experience, but it's been great. And the film is really about um, uh, learning about people around you and um, sort of being a stranger in a strange land. So um, if those kind of stories are appealing, <laughs> I think it may may be good for people with sort of a science fiction uh, undertone. And um, is there uh, anything else you want to talk about, a plug, or just where people can catch you on social media, things like that? Yeah, no, my just my name. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and all the things. Um, I mostly retweet William Gibson. So if you like uh, <laughs> William Gibson, stuff. I mean, I had to, I have, I had to give a shout out because I think, um, you know, again, Gibson. I'm a huge Gibson fan, obviously. But this movie, as goofy as it was, really was. Um, 
really expanded uh, imagination and sort of like how you can um, talk about science fiction and new ideas and this kind of stuff and just kind of let go of um, everything needed, needing to be grounded all the time. So, um, you know, I think it's a fun, it's a fun little piece, but yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't see as seen eye to eye on this, Natasha, but I have thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. <laughs> Um, Look, it's objectively bad. It is an objectively bad movie. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. But I, I encourage people to go and check it out. But also watch Imitation Girl because that movie is not as bad as Johnny Mnemonic. It's certainly, it's certainly <laughs> yeah, not. No, yeah, it's certainly not. Watched. Yeah. Natasha, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, guys. So I think it's fair to say that you probably weren't talked around. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's true. But yeah. I think that again, I think that like when you go in, kind of how I felt about going into detention. Uh, whereas like when we when we when I defended detention in episode three, where it was like I knew that your like your dislike for the film was such that I was never gonna you were never gonna come away from the conversation being like I have abandoned my previous beliefs and I think this film is fucking great now. I think like trying to trying to get you to take more out of it was my goal, and I think that Natasha managed that tonight. I would say. Well, yeah, I mean. I think it's always beneficial to hear someone talk so passionately about something, even if it's something that you don't particularly like or you don't have a massive affection for. Yeah, I agree. It, it certainly kind of pulls you down to somebody's way of thinking a little bit. Yeah. And it does. I mean, I've mean, i I've said it. I, I really don't think there's ever been an episode that we've done of this show so far. Even Detention, Yeah. which I will say, um, I will hold my hand up and say, I came away with more of an appreciation for Detention than yeah. I had gone in. Maybe it didn't necessarily make me think this is now one of my favourite films. Um, but I certainly left up with a little bit more appreciation than I came in with. Yeah. And I feel that that's the same thing that happened tonight with Johnny Mnemonic. And I think the fact that Natasha appreciated that the kind of... She, she came in with a requisite level of sense of humour uh, regarding the film, I think, was an important thing. Yeah, and a bit of an understanding of what you were setting up for by coming mm -hmm. on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And the, the charming things about the film were never lost on me. And the charming things are the things that are most important to talk about in the film. Uh, I think that it's all those little daft, ridiculous moments that, w that almost get you close to winning over with mm -hmm. Johnny Mnemonic until you realise that Actually, hang on. Yeah, this is still a pretty bad film. Yeah, I think I, that's fair. I mean, I mean, I, I think I probably didn't dislike it as much as you did going in, mm -hmm. but I was certainly not. I did, like I didn't particularly enjoy it in first watch. And like I say, I've got an inclination to watch it again at some point. <laughs> Uh, just in the, just off the back of this conversation, just to see. You're a masochist. Well, the, <laughs> I mean, and God knows when I'll do that, considering that my list currently contains. Making my way through the shop. You've got 97 films to watch. Fucking hell. Immediately. Um, 97 films. Plus one per week for this yeah, show. Yeah, you've got, well, at least one per week for this show. So that, because you've got to do all of that, so we've got something to talk about in the very soon. That's so true. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, so my intention would be to maybe revisit it at some point, but at this point, I have to call that just like an undetermined time in the future. You need a hard drive in your brain. An 80 gig one. I think you'll need more than 80 gig. Oh, I'll get an expander. A doubler. A doubler, thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank a you, Natasha. A doubler. Yeah, yeah, a doubler. Yeah, uh, I was going to call it a booster. I'm uh, grateful for the terms doubler and battle thumb. Battle thumb. I'll take both of those. I'll take both of those to my grave. I'm happy with them. Yeah, that's fine. But I guess that's just about it for more another or, one. Ugh, more or less, I suppose. Yeah, it's almost time to wrap up again. Uh, do you know what? I, I like the fact that we've moved the feedback section into the mini swords, but I do miss it. Yeah, I miss bit. it. I always feel like the endings now feel a little bit abrupt, but this is the balance that you can never get entirely right. But yeah, we'll be back Monday morning, 8 a.m., GMT, BST, whatever you want to call it. We'll be back then with another mini-sode. If you want to get in touch before then, you can do loads of ways to do that. Facebook and Instagram, we are Strong Language Violent Scenes. You can always tweet us at Strong Violent PC. And you can also email us at stronglanguageviolentscenes at gmail.com. I would actually love to hear from people about this film. Definitely. So yeah, please, yeah, yeah. please, please be as vocal as you can because I want to know what other people think about this. Yeah, I, 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 would, li I would like that also, yeah. And a word on the Gmail and, I guess, the related PayPal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The PayPal, is, like I've said before, is primarily for business purposes, but PayPal does go both ways. So if you ever do feel like slinging us a couple of quid just to help the show grow and to help us continue to do it and alleviate any costs that we might have incurred, then every little bit helps, but please don't ever feel obligated. No, I mean, because I mean, we have we have some plans for kind of how we want to grow this. 
Um, but we're going to do those anyway. Yeah, they're going to happen anyway. Um, yeah, but if but if and I mean ultimately the best way you can help out is by keeping on listening, sharing, rating, reviewing. Yeah, if you listen on, and, and that brings us me nicely actually on to talking about where you can listen now. iTunes is one of them. Yep. Um, and if you do listen on iTunes, please subscribe and rate us and review us. Um, yeah, it really does help and kind of raising our profile on iTunes certainly. Yeah, that would be greatly appreciated, Jane. Yeah. Yeah. And aside from iTunes, you can listen to us at our home in Podbean. Yep. Uh, Google Podcasts, mm-hmm. Stitcher, yep. and Spotify. Can indeed. So, I guess we're done. Yeah. It's that time again. So, as ever, thanks for joining us, and a big thank you to Natasha Kamani coming on to talk both Imitation Girl and Johnny Mnemonic with us tonight. We'll be back Monday, and in the meantime, don't forget that it is better to die a hero than live as food in a world of chuds. Good night. Good night. You've been listening to Strong Language and Violent Scenes with Andy Stewart and Mitch Bain. Strong Language and Violent Scenes theme by Mitch Bain, production and artwork by Andy Stewart. Find us on Stitcher, iTunes and Podbean.